Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. And well, this is our pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar. Um, we've got Leonie Payne here, who's doing her stage one PhD presentation to summarize where she's got to um, over the, the last year. Uh, particularly want to welcome, we've got two reviewers online and one here with us. Online, we've got Joe McKenzie, who is the former director of our Institute for Multimedia and Learning here at UTS and a professor with a lot of experience in learning and assessment and, and how that plays out in the institution. We've got Lynn Alderman. Fantastic to have you here with us, Lynn. Um, she is a principal at the Evaluators Collective. She was chief evaluator for the Australian Department of Social Services. And um, before that, a lot of experience at QUT and nationally in evaluation within the higher education sector. And finally, here with us in the room is James Brown, who is a professor of official statistics here at UTS in the School of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. And he's also a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. So we've got a great group of people here, along with all, all of us here from the Connected Intelligence Center, cheering you on, Leone, and, and, and a whole bunch of people online, some of whom I recognize and some of whom I don't. So welcome to you all as well. It's great to have this interest. So without further ado, Leone's gonna give us a summary of where she's got to. There'll be the chance for about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, questions and answers. And after that, the reviewers and Leone and us will retire to have a more extended sort of mini viva uh, for more in-depth conversation. But over to you, Leone. Thank you, Simon. And welcome everybody to my presentation. All right. So my PhD topic is bringing rigor to the evaluation of higher education, specifically evaluating the quality of the student learning experience in higher education. There's many ways to do this. You can use peer observations, teaching materials, instructor self-reflections, alumni ratings, or indeed you could ask the students their perspective on their educational experience. This is a, not an area without controversy. Um, and I will address some of those controversies today. We can speak to the students through interviews or we can use student evaluations of teaching, which I will refer to as SETS. So SETS in higher education have a changing purpose. They're questionnaires that are provided to students, either qualitative or quantitative. In Australia, they've become more prevalent since the 1990s. And their purpose is moving from formative to summative. So from a method of just improving education to making high stakes decisions that affect academic staff in universities. Decisions regarding hiring, investment in staff education, ranking of universities. So we have the quality indicators for learning and teaching. This is a suite of four surveys that are asked of students. Uh, the student experience survey, which is a typical student evaluation survey. Then there's the Graduate Outcome Survey, the Longitudinal Form, and the Employer Satisfaction Survey. So historically, the quilt has been used to rank universities, but the stakes are increasing and it's going to be used for performance-based funding. Now, it's one, or two of the four branches of performance-based funding will be based upon quilt surveys. And there's different perspectives on how the performance-based funding will impact funding to universities. Because each university tends to have strengths in different areas of the four branches. But nevertheless, uh, with the economy recovering from COVID, these quilt surveys will be a way of differentiating between universities when it comes to funding. So as I said, from 2020, the Australian Federal Government will apply performance-based funding to higher education institutions. And the two key metrics in the quilt will be the student experience survey, which is 20% of the weighting of the funding decision and the graduate outcome survey. Now there are 
many perspectives on using student evaluation surveys to determine the quality of a teaching experience and performance-based funding. And one of the criticisms of SETs is that they are inherently biased, that students aren't able to discern a quality education experience. But first I'll define bias. And bias is where student ratings are based on variables that are unrelated to teaching effectiveness, and perhaps to the extent that this influence generalizes across all rating factors. So I'll emphasize that it's factors unrelated to teaching effectiveness. Now claims of bias are prevalent when we're making comparisons of different populations. So it's important for us to consider the context of the question that's driving the analysis. If we're looking at a single population, and an example of this would be if the vice chancellor is interested in whether students are happy on campus, then the main concern is that the sample of students who respond is representative of the overall population. But if we're making comparisons such as should I promote an instructor, should I invest funds in this faculty, or what are the rankings, then it's important that we make like for like comparisons because we're comparing different populations potentially. So sets is a contested field with conflicting arguments. The arguments that discredit the use of sets include that they are popularity contests, easy to game, that instructors are rewarded if they don't ask a great deal of their students, that innovative teaching methods are punished, generally that students can't judge appropriate educational experiences. And then there are the claims of biases based upon the gender, non-English speaking background, preferred learning design, class size and stage of study. Countering these arguments are those supporting the use of sets. It is an opportunity to improve course content, that the concerns for claims of bias are unsupported myths, um, and that academics and administrators are not familiar with best practice, and that multi-section validity studies actually show there's a moderately positive correlation between sets and student achievement. So I'm going to discuss two types of bias that are claimed to exist in sets and show that when you look at the research in the literature review, it's actually very inconsistent in whether it supports these claims of bias. So a halo bias is where we have some sort of general feeling that has nothing to do with effective teaching. And a halo might be based upon the person's appearance or their personality, or in factors such as their demographics, whether they're women or male or whether they're English as second language speakers or early career academics. Um, arguments discrediting claims that females, ESL speakers and early career academics are punished are that the multi-section validity studies I mentioned earlier. And there's also studies that show that students can rate instructional skills, um, that things like preparation and organization and courtesy of students. Similarly, there is inconsistent support for claims of gender bias. So female professors are often claimed to be held to double or shifting standards, um, often higher expectations of male professors. People who hold this view say that this is intensified for academically entitled students, where if students who make unreasonable requests of academics and those requests are denied, they're more likely to punish female professors through their sets. And then there are also a series of online studies where the gender of the instructor is not known by students and it doesn't necessarily match the gender name. So there might be a female instructor who's labelled as John in an online environment. And it's shown that the male name is generally preferred, even if the students didn't perform as well with that instructor. So discrediting the claim of bias is that the ideal professor is a combination of masculine and feminine stereotypes. This is supported by factor analysis and principal component analysis. And that some studies show there is actually a bias towards female professors, which counters the other argument. So overall, we have these very inconsistent claims of bias within student evaluation surveys. And the question uh, is why? why why, if there are these claims, are they so inconsistently reflected in literature? I would argue that these claims are largely reliant on hypothesis testing and the analysis is conducted on small samples. 
which leads it to having evidence of the replicational crisis where there are false positives and false negatives and it's hard to replicate the conclusions that the studies have conclude. So we have a situation where academics may quite justifiably be frustrated with the student evaluation surveys that they are receiving and they may aim to discredit the use of sets in performance evaluation but they're using similar statistical analysis to do this. So this reliance of hypothesis testing leading to the replication crisis. So we have an illegitimate analysis for a legitimate complaint. So the question is, should we ask students their opinion on their educational experience at all? I argue that we should. Universities have a monopoly on higher education market and students are increasingly paying a lot more for that experience. The student data and opinion may or may not be valid, but it's the inadequate statistical analysis of set data that is the issue. So if we use student data with a more advanced, robust statistical techniques, maybe we're in a better position to make more like for like comparisons or to identify biases where they occur. So we have the research gap. Analysis of sets lacks a strong theoretical and statistical foundation. Academics researchers conduct ad hoc analysis for claims of bias generally with small sample sizes. This leads to a reliance on hypothesis testing and the replication crisis. Analysis is not based on like for like comparisons and often does not take into account the impact of non-response bias. Therefore, claims of bias are difficult to validate even if bias is actually present. So this leads to my research questions. What biases exist in student evaluations of teaching? How are they related? What methods may be used to account for bias? And what is the best way to communicate the highly technical results of my analysis to a non-statistical audience? My first contribution answering or attempting to answer the first research question is to produce a mathematical and conceptual model of bias, which will unify the existing claims of bias in set literature and show where bias is in the survey process and then to identify places where we might use more advanced statistical methods to address this bias. My second contribution is tracing bias in sets methodology. So there is a conceptual model of bias I will create and also a series of critical questions used to elucidate where bias might be creeping into a survey methodology. And my third contribution is implementing Monte Carlo resampling techniques. And I will demonstrate that uh, for you today. My fourth contribution, answering the third research question, is to develop some visualisation packages, communication tools that non-technical audiences can understand and that university quality and planning units can implement if they're interested in using my research. So, preliminary results. What is bias? Here we have my contributions of the definitions of statistical and prejudicial biases and a preliminary mathematical model of bias. So we have a situation where there's a population of interest and then we make a survey frame of students we are targeting in that population and then a portion of that survey frame will actually respond to the survey. So there's three levels. And at the population level, there are what I am terming prejudicial biases. And these will exist even in the, con the context of the census, uh, where, as before, the halo bias or the gender bias, there's a tendency to rate instructors higher or lower based upon factors unrelated to teaching effectiveness. I delineate this from statistical biases where the survey responses don't reflect the population as a whole. And there are two areas, the sampling bias, where's where you establish the initial survey frame, and then the non-response bias, where the students who are targeted choose not to respond. And keeping those definitions in mind, I'm extending the mathematical model of bias. So I'm starting with Grove's 2004 definition of sampling bias and non-response bias. I will unify these biases into the one equation and add a mathematical definition of prejudicial bias. So for sampling bias. You start with a population statistic, and this is any linear statistic. 
And then there are two factors which will adjust that population statistic. The proportion of people who are not covered by the survey frame and the difference in statistic between those covered and not covered by the survey frame. And this leads to the value of a statistic within the survey frame. Similarly, and similarly derived, we have the non-response bias definition. So we have the value of the statistic in the survey frame to start with. We then have the proportion of non-respondents and the difference in statistic between the respondents and the non-respondents. So there's two components here. It's not just the response rate that matters, but it's the difference in statistic between respondents and non-respondents. And that leads, leaves us with the value of a statistic for respondents. So I'm going to unify these definitions um, in the scenario where we have a single population. So there's no comparisons being made. So prejudicial biases are not relevant because we have the one population. So how well do the sample response represent, represent the population's views? And we start off with the value of the statistic in the survey frame, which is indicated by this formula that we showed earlier. We then have the proportion of non-respondents and the difference in the statistic between the respondents and non-respondents, leaving us with the value of the statistic for respondents. So that was a fairly straightforward step. The next scenario, next scenario is where we're making comparisons between individual instructors or organisational units. And this is where we introduce the prejudicial bias definition. So we're looking at a comparison of populations. And we start off with the population statistic. And we have the proportion of students with the prejudicial bias. The difference in the statistic between those with and without the prejudicial bias leaves us with the value of a statistic without the prejudicial bias. Now, that is a, a very basic preliminary mathematical model. There are ways in which I want to extend this model over the next couple of years. And I will be answering questions like, can I better represent the change in proportions of the prejudicial bias at the sampling and the response level? And also addressing issues of, if we consider what other populations within constraints could produce the same sample survey frame. So we have now a preliminary mathematical model answering what is bias. Now the question is, where does bias occur and how do you find it? And I've developed a conceptual model of bias and the critical questions tracing bias. So with the conceptual model, I've identified four areas within the survey methodology where bias tends to creep in. And that's when we're making comparison effects, where the sampling is non-representative during the construction of the survey itself and with inappropriate analysis and interpretation of results. I then show the different biases that may be impacted at these different areas. Prejudicial bias is indicated by a P and statistical bias is by an S. Then there's more detail about exactly what's happening, where these biases are occurring. And then the possible solutions, both the solutions that are currently used in set literature and the ones that I'm proposing with Monte Carlo resampling. So looking at the critical questions in tracing bias, to identify where prejudicial and statistical biases enter the survey methodology. So I have I de uh, defined prejudicial bias and statistical bias as being sampling and non-response. And these questions are focusing on these definitions. So what aspects of the survey methodology will increase the probability of a student being targeted in the sample or increase the probability of a targeted student responding or in, enhance the interaction of prejudicial and statistical biases. And the interaction occurs when you have different proportions of students in the population sample and responses who have these biases. So now we've identified what biases are, where they may occur. If you identify them, how do you analyse it? What can you do about this bias? And my contribution will be the application of Monte Carlo resampling. So the question is, why choose Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo is a non-parametric approach to statistical inference. And by non-parametric, we mean it doesn't make assumptions about the statistics sampling distribution, but it takes the, the responses of the data you have 
and then makes multiple resamples of that data to come up with the statistic sampling distribution. It's useful when the sampling distribution is unknown or intractable and when analytic solutions are not available or won't work. It doesn't assume the distribution of the data, as I said, for instance, that the data needs to be normal or Gaussian. And it doesn't require ordinal Likert data to be average as though it were interval data. So the data I'm going to use is publicly available data that was listed um, by the University of New South Wales. It is their de-identified Likert scale responses from internal sets over a seven year period. There's a six point Likert scale used. So one is strongly negative and six is strongly positive. So scores four, five and six will be a percent favourable score, which is what I will use in my analysis. We have the gender and residency status of the students who responded, and we know the total number of students approached for the survey, so we have a response rate, but we don't know the demographics for non-respondents. So what I'm planning to do is to use the data that we have in the responses to come up with a boundary selection function of what our uh, percent favourable response might look like if we consider the non-response bias. So to do this, we're going to resample student responses to represent the potential bounds of non-respondents. Now there is an initial assumption uh, that's fundamental in the technique I'm using today, but late in future we can relax this assumption. And that assumption is that students who didn't respond will share similar responses to students that did respond based upon shared demographic characteristics. So the idea is that the females who chose not to respond through shared life experiences might have a similar distribution of responses as the females who did respond and that the males who didn't respond will share similar response characteristics to the males that did respond. We then use bootstrapping to resample the students who responded. Um, so if we have a response rate of say 40%, so I have 40% of responses and they're male and female. But then there's 60% of students who haven't responded and we don't know necessarily what they would have responded as. If we assume that they would respond similarly, then I can resample that 60% of responses where in one example, I'll use 100% are female and then I'll do 10% male, 20% male, 30% male to 100% male. So we have this continuum and come up with a different error bar to see what happens when we consider non-response bias. And this is where I will go to my shiny dashboard. Okay. Beautiful. Perfect. So sitting behind this dashboard is all of the University of New South Wales data. And at the moment I've got the business school up. I can choose the engineering school. And I'm choosing to look at percent favorable response. So scores four, five and six, but in this dashboard I've created. So you, you could look at any score you're interested in. We have the students approached by the survey is 506,000 in the faculty. The total responded was 220,000. So we have a response rate of 43.4%. And that 43.4%, 51% of them are actually domestic students. The score for those responders was 86.5% favorable. Now, if we sample for the non-responders and assume that they're all domestic students, that percent favorable goes down to 84.3%. I'll just shift up for a moment. So here the actual is the pink and the simulated is the blue. And you can see that the fives and sixes have gone down proportionally and the one, twos and threes have gone up. Now I could do 90%, 80% or continuously until I get to all the students being internationals. And in this example, the percent favorable goes up to 88.6. And you can see that in the 
relative balance of the scores. So that leaves an error bar of about 4.3%. Now, I've done a summary for you showing the differences where if it's 100% domestic non-response, um, it's minus 2.2. And if it's international, it's 2.1. So a total error bar of 4.3%. Now, the crucial question is, could a 1% to 4% difference in favourable responses be significant for university rankings? I've shown it, that it's prevalent for faculty scores, but could it impact university rankings in the quilt? The answer is yes. In the 2018 quilt SES, the University of Queensland ranked 13th and Monash ranked 25th with a difference of only 2.5%. This is only considering non-response bias. I'm not taking into account the differences in the demographics between these different universities. So if I then look at the 2018 Quilt SES overall rankings, the median score was 79.4%. If I go plus or minus 2% of this median, that means that 22 universities could potentially have shifted their rankings. And this is the actual SES score that will be used for performance-based funding. So uh, the achievements and limitations in my early results of Monte Carlo resampling. I've demonstrated that we can show potential boundaries if all students responded. And the wider the boundaries are, the greater presence of bias in the sample. But what if we relax the initial assumptions and also consider that multiple populations could produce the same sample? This leads to my proposed future work. I have these unanswered questions that I'd like to explore over the next two years. So what different student population responses could have led to the observed sample? I.e. what possible worlds or universes would have led to the um, observed sample? And given the context of a human resources decision on an individual's promotion, in what proportion of these universes would the candidate have satisfied a specified promotion criteria? To do this, I will further refine the mathematical conceptual model of bias. I will use the critical questions for tracing bias in student surveys and further establish the bias measurement technique, um, looking at the application of Monte Carlo resampling within astronomy. Um, I will implement this using my sandbox University of New South Wales data set, and also then with ethics permission, use UTS wide quilt SFS data sets and do finally, a quilt cross-institutional study where I compare different universities and how their reported quilt results may be impacted by these biases. I plan to develop the communication tools and implement them in R, making that package available on GitHub and developing a website to promote the profile and dissemination of my work. In terms of publications and conferences, I have three journal articles in mind. I'm targeting a series of journals that contain best practice in this area and publish um, the leading researchers in this area. And they're all international journals. And the conference I'm targeting is educational data mining. I have a three year plan. And at this point, I'll open the floor to discussion.